Pharisees. In Genesis 32, we have an interesting story of a man by the name of Jacob. You've heard his name before. Uh, Jacob was a man that faced a lot of struggles in his life as he grew to be the man of God that God needed him to be. And sometimes those struggles are self-inflicted, and other times those struggles and challenges are God-ordained and divine appointments that God allows into our lives to strengthen us and to grow us. Many of those uh, we see in the like of Jacob, but many others of his trials were self-inflicted. And as we'll see here in a moment, the story of Jacob is a great opportunity to learn important lessons about ourselves and about our God. And Genesis 32 contains an amazing story. Listen now, how Jacob wrestled with God. That sort of seems a little odd that anyone would think that they would ever be able to wrestle with God and end that event and that, that confrontation uh, with anything other than uh, the judgment of God upon their lives. But, but Jacob was a man that wrestled with God and, and God, that night of, of interaction and encounter with God was a life-changing event in his life. It was an event that would carry on until his death. Let me give you just a little background uh, to build a foundation for the message this morning. The events described in Jacob's story comprise Genesis chapter 25 all the way through Genesis 49. So there's a lot of information that's given in the Bible that tells about this man, Jacob. Jacob was the son of Isaac and Rebekah. He was a grandson of Abraham. And, of course, Abraham, the father of the Israelite nation and of our faith, as we see looking back on it in our Old Testament. And uh, Jacob had a twin brother by the name of Esau, who was born first. And uh, from that very instance, there was a, a sibling rivalry, a struggle that began uh, within the womb of, uh, of their mother, and uh, Esau was born first, very just 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 by by moments earlier as twins, and Jacob came along after that. The name Jacob and names meant quite a bit in the Bible. When you named a child something, that name was almost a prophetic um, uh, of what that person would accomplish or what they would do. And and Jacob's name by by definition meant supplanter or to grab another's heel. It means to take what belongs to someone else. He was a deceiver, a supplanter, uh, someone that, uh, that was untrustworthy by definition of his name. Sad to uh, find out, though, much of his name was fulfilled in his life. life. And uh, we look at his life, and sure enough, uh, the name Jacob followed him uh, through much of his uh, years, especially those early years of his life. Jacob is born a twin, and spends his life in a sibling rivalry uh, with his slightly older brother Esau. Because of his deceptive behavior, uh, it incurs Esau's anger. And uh, this anger and this rivalry began to, uh, to just uh, intensify over the year. Jacob flees for his life to Haran, where the family's ancestral home was in Mesopotamia. And he fled for his life from Esau, uh, because Esau uh, was out to kill him because of the betrayal, the deception that Jacob had done against him as his brother. And so we see here that uh, when he arrives in Haran, uh, all that he has are the clothes on his back. Uh, he arrives with nothing. And 20 years later, he leaves a very blessed man, very wealthy and had many herds of animals and children and had 12 children and, and uh, wives and, and concubines. And, and, and so he left uh, much more leaving than when he arrived. As he returns to Canaan, the Bible tells us in our story, he wrestles with God. He then reconciles with his brother Esau and then he settles again in the promised land. Jacob's sons are very jealous over the youngest son, Joseph, uh, because when Joseph was giving that coat of many colors, it wasn't just a favoritism that caused the jealousy, but it was a transfer of authority. That uh, colored garment, that uh, robe of many colors was, was signifying the authority that the younger would have over the elders and uh, the older brothers. And as a sibling that's older, none of us like to be in subjection or submission uh, to a younger sibling. We're the leader. We're the example. We're the role model. We're the one that's to follow. 
When Jacob is an old man, a famine devastates Canaan, forcing the family to buy grain in Egypt. Through a course of events, Joseph reconciles with his brothers and moves the entire family to Egypt, where Jacob would then die at the age of 147. Jacob's name, Deceiver, is renamed by God as Israel, or one that struggled with God, one that laid hold of God. Uh, remember, he was grabbing hold of something that did not belong to him with Esau, taking something that was not his, and now he wrestled with God, and he's able to take hold of God. The entire nation's name is changed after this patriarch, and the nation now becomes Israel. Uh, the word El is the word God uh, in the Greek language, in the Hebrew language, in the Old Testament. And so when you see El Shaddai, or uh, El in front of anything, Bethel, house of God. And, and so we recognize that Israel, uh, El, has God. And so God now is in his name. Before he is a deceptor, deceiver, now God is a part of his life. And so we see several times in the Bible where names are changed. Abram is renamed Abraham. Sarai is renamed Sarah. Simon is renamed Peter. Jacob's new name now contains the name of God, El, Israel, within it. He had an encounter with God, and this encounter with God would last him for an entire life. And we see it following all the way up to his death. And, I, and my prayer today is to help us understand the importance and the value of you and I encountering God. Because once you and I encounter God, and there's a, there's a, a wrestling match with God uh, occasion in your life, uh, you'll leave a different person. You'll leave with the power of God and the blessing of God. If you respond like Jacob responded to that wrestling match with God, you can leave much more strengthened than when you started that amount with God. In Revelation chapter 2, the Bible says, He that hath an ear, let him hear with the Spirit. Say unto the churches, to him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone. And in that stone a new name written, which no man uh, saving he that receiveth. And so God wants to give all of us a new name. And uh, that new name is very important. We see in Revelation chapter 2 that it would be a white stone that would have engraved on that stone a new name. And only you would know what that name was. Only I would know what that name was. In the ancient world, jurors at a trial would vote with stones. They'd hear a case and uh, they would come up with a verdict. If they felt that the evidence was uh, supporting an innocence, not guilty, then they would uh, present a white stone. If they thought that the, the evidence was a guilty case, verdict, then they would then give a black stone. And that would be how they would determine the, the guilt or the innocence of an individual. Jesus says at our trial before God, that God says he will give us a, a white stone with a new name on it, which signifies we're innocent. Not because we're innocent, but because we're tried under a different name. The name Randy Ralston isn't going to have all those sins listed next to it. It's not going to have all the, the, the condemnation that's deserving of that sin. We've got a new name. That white stone that's given to us, there's a new name written down in heaven. And it's mine. Listen, that white stone, you're innocent, you're judged by Jesus Christ with the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, satisfied, propitiation, justified, just as if you never sinned. So God says, here's Jesus gives to God the white stone. I don't see any guilt on this name. I don't see any judgment deserving on this name. So a new name was very significant in the Bible times as well as for us as a child of God. And the only way you'll get a white stone is to have your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's not being a Baptist that gives you a white stone. It's not being baptized or confirmed that gives you a white stone. Uh, it's not being a good person that gives you a white stone. It's accepting the Lord Jesus Christ and recognize you're a sinner deserving of hell on your way to heaven by your faith in Christ. God gives you a new name. That new name of, of innocence before holy God. And so we see then as Jacob the supplanter, the deceiver, now he's given a new name. Israel. Israel. You've grabbed a hold of God. God now is a part 
of your life. And so from this very imperfect man, we can learn some very important lessons of faith. And that's what I'd like to help us with uh, today. I've entitled uh, the message this morning, Turning Your Trials into a Testimony. Turning Your Trials into a Testimony. It's really how you respond and learn from the life of Jacob. Number one, I'd like you to see the first lesson that we can learn from Jacob is winning the blessing only comes by losing to God. Winning the blessing of God only comes when you first lose to God. In Genesis 32, Jacob is on his way back home to Canaan with his family, his wives, his children, his flocks. And now they're after a 20-year sojourn to Penetram where they were living. After these last 20 years, he had been gone for 20 years. He's coming back. He's scared to death because he knows he's got to confront Esau. He's scared to death because these 20 years, he can only imagine the anger and the fury and the, and the passion of rage that his brother must have. But what did he realize? As God was working on Jacob's heart 20 years away from his brother, God was also working on his brother's heart as they were separated, waiting for the, the proper time of interaction of them being able to come together again. And so we see the fear, and Esau's coming to meet him. 400 men, look what it says in Genesis 32, verse number 6. It says, and the messenger, so Jacob sends out messengers ahead of his family to see uh, what, what's ahead. And the messengers return in verse number 6 uh, in, uh, to Jacob, saying, we, we, uh, we came to thy brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet thee, and 400 men with him. He says, as you're heading home, he's heading your direction. He must have found out, Jacob, you're coming home. And before you ever get home, he wanted to meet you. And you're going to imagine what was going through Jacob's mind. Because the last time he left Jacob, left Esau, he was fleeing for his life. His brother was trying to kill him. And he got out of Dodge. He got out of town. And now he's coming and he hears there's 400 men coming with Esau. Now, this wasn't a welcoming party as far as Jacob understood. These were, these were men within the, the army of Esau. These were men that were coming as far as Jacob knew to wipe out his entire family. And so we see after splitting up his household, and it tells us in the story in uh, uh, chapter 32, uh, we see he splits up his, his family into various camps and uh, to try to avoid complete annihilation. And he said, well, if Esau comes in and gets this part of our family, then the rest of you flee for your life. Or if he comes in and gets this side, then the rest of you flee. We're not going to stay together. We can't put all the eggs in the same basket. Got to spread out and make sure that we survive. And uh, so he's coming up with ideas to try to figure out and uh, how to avoid uh, total annihilation. We see then that Jacob could not sleep, obviously, that night. He had an a, 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 a insomnia. He could not sleep at all. And, and no, no doubt because of the fear that uh, per, pervaded his heart. And so Jacob uh, intended to spend a night alone, no doubt, in desperate prayer. Look what the Bible says in verse 24 of chapter 32. And after he gave all the orders to his family, the Bible says, then Jacob was left alone. You know what? We live in a world that we don't like being alone. And uh, we'll turn the TV on for noise. And uh, we'll turn the radio on for noise. And uh, But you know what? The power of God, the blessing of God, and the encounter with God, and the time to rest with God is going to take place when you're alone with God. you got no crutches to lean upon. you got nothing to distract you. All you have is just you and God. And so here's Jacob. He's left alone. The Bible says in there, while he was alone, there rest, rest, wrestled a man with him with the breaking of the day. All night he spends wrestling with this man. Now he'll find out in a moment that this man uh, was a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. God in the flesh was there wrestling with him at this moment of time. And all night he wrestles with God. And uh, we recognize that the lesson he learns is that winning the blessing only comes when you first lose to God. You see, he already knows uh, his name. And so in prayer, this man wrestling uh, Jacob until uh, daybreak interrupts the plans. And look what he says. The Bible says in verse number 25, And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. So there's this match taking place. 
There's this wrestling match going on all night. It's about to get daylight, daybreak, and uh, God knows that no man can see God and live. And so before day shows up, uh, and the prevailing has not taken place yet, we'll see what that means in a moment, God touches the, the, the hollow of his thigh where it's out of joints. And now we see Jacob in an injured, limping, disabled position, and notice what, what it goes on, and, and it says, verse, 20, uh, set, verse 26, And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, Jacob said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. Oh, I wonder how many of us are so intent on God blessing us that we won't let go, no matter how much pain's inflicted, no matter how much hardship we have to go through, no matter how many battles you got to face, you're hanging on to God, saying, God, I've got to be blessed with you. I've got to have your power. I've got to have your strength. God, I must have your blessing. I'm not going to let go. So many times we let go in bitterness and anger and resentment for God and what God's allowed into our life, but not Jacob. He said, I'm not letting go. I'm going to hang on. And so I'm not letting go until you bless me. Look at verse 27. And, and he said unto him, what is thy name? So this man, this angelic being, a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ, uh, uh, God uh, there, in the flesh there before, uh, we see Christ showing up in the New Testament. He says, all right, what's your name? And notice Jacob's response. He said, my name here is what? It's Jacob. It's Jacob. It's strange that at daybreak, the wrestling match is interrupted, and he asks for Jacob's name. Now, God already knows Jacob's name. By the way, whenever God asks a question in Scripture, God's not asking the question because he's ignorant or unaware of what the answer is. He wants you to be aware of what the situation is. He wants you to take ownership and responsibility. He's asking you a question so you become aware of something that you need to be in tune to in your life. Uh, just like he did in Genesis. He says, Adam, where art thou? He knew where Adam was, but he wanted Adam to realize that you're hiding from God. You're not walking with God. You're not serving God. He wanted Adam to come face to face with the reality of where he was in his walk with God. And so he asked questions in the Bible. And this was a question he asked, not because he didn't know Jacob's name, but he wanted Jacob to recognize something in admitting his name. When Jacob had stolen the blessing from his daddy uh, years before, and when, when uh, his dad asked him, what is your name? Jacob said, my name is Esau. The last time someone asked his name, he said, it's Esau. And he had uh, uh, goat uh, skin uh, with the fur on there because his brother was, was a hairy man, a man of the wild, they said. And, and, uh, and so he had the, the smell of an outdoorsman. And, and Jacob was more of a mama's boy and more uh, inside a lot. And his hands weren't callous and his hands uh, weren't uh, uh, roughened up by working on the outside. And so uh, uh, his father knew the difference. And he says, what's your name? Your voice isn't the voice of... Esau, it's the voice of Jacob. Who are you? And he says, Dad, it's, it's me. It's Esau. But now he tells the truth. He's asked the question again, what's your name? And now he says, it's a deceiver. It's a supplanter. It's a one that tries to manipulate things. It's a one that, that tries to uh, be crafty and subtle and sly. And it's me. It's Jacob. I'm the deceptive one. I'm the liar. I'm the supplanter. It's me, God. You see, in order for you to win the blessing of God, you've got to lose to God to win from God. But you've got to lose to what you desire in your life so that God can accomplish something great in your life. And so he had to uh, win the blessing. comes only by losing to God. Jacob tried all his life to obtain God's blessings his way by his manipulation. But now he must surrender. Now he must submit if he expects to succeed. Look in Genesis 32 and verse 28. This is a key passage uh, of the scriptures that we're looking at. And he said, thy name, God goes on to tell him, thy name shall be called no more Jacob. No more Jacob. You're going to be a different person, different direction, different goals, different purpose in your life. Now he says your name's going to be what? Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. See that last verse there, verse there, words there in verse 28? Thou hast what? Prevailed. 
prevailed. What's that mean, prevailed? Did he actually overcome God? Did he actually overpower God? Did he actually put God in a manhole where God had to cry out uncle and says, I surrender, I surrender? Uh -uh. Don't get the wrong impression here. Don't think that Jacob overcame through wrestling. Jacob did not overcome through wrestling. Jacob overcame through submission, through subjection, through yielding to God. He won when he died and he lost to God. And when he lost to God, he obtained the blessing of God in his life. Look at verses 25 and 26. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day break. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And so when God says he saw that he prevailed not against him now, uh, that doesn't mean that Jacob was stronger than God. It means that Jacob wouldn't give him. He wouldn't break that will. He was stubborn. He was defiant. He wasn't going to surrender and yield to God. Why? He'd always try to force the blessing of God. He'd always try to make things happen his way. He wanted things done his way. And God finally says, am I going to prevail? You've got to lose to God for you to ever enjoy the blessings of God in your life. I wonder how many of us today are forfeiting the blessings of God because of our defiance, our resistance, our stubbornness, our, our holding back from God and saying, no, I'm not going to yield. I'm not going to surrender. I'm not going to submit. But when he prevailed not, God says, then God touched his thigh. And now he begins to have a thigh, a hip joint, a out of joint as a result of that. And so he must surrender uh, to succeed. And so the angel of God said, listen, his flesh wouldn't break. He was determined to keep on supplanting, to keep on grabbing a hold, to keep on struggling for God's blessing. He would not surrender. He would not give in. He would not submit. I wonder how many of us today, you're wrestling with God, and you say, I won't surrender. I won't submit. I won't do it your way, God. I want to do it my way. I don't want to do it your way. I to do it my way and they're holding on to God and God says all right if you're not going to win the, the win the victory by losing to God then God says I have to bring something into your life to cause you to lose to God so that I can finally allow you to win the blessing that I've always wanted you to have in the first place so to win the blessing of God you're going to have to lose to God as Jacob had to lose to God and so we see in verse number 25 he touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of Jacob's side was out of joint. You know what happened? God broke him. God broke him. You understand, we all have a breaking point. And you may be holding stiff-necked against God right now, but you've got a breaking point. I don't know what phone call it might need to be. I don't know what kind of doctor report it might need to be. I don't know what kind of answer it has to be. But you and I all have a breaking point. And God reached out and touched the hollow of his thigh, and he broke him. He lost to God so that he could win the blessings of God in his life. I wonder, uh, had he gotten broken sooner, had he not ever had that limp? I want you to see, he's not a big macho man now saying, I'll not let you go until you bless me. He's not holding his ground saying, ah, I'm not letting go until you bless me. He has yielded, surrendered, submitted. There's no strength left that he has to fight against God. Because he wanted the blessing his way for his purposes, for his accomplishments, for his accolades, for his own self-worth. Isn't that the state uh, that you prevailed in? Not at all. The consequence is he finally surrendered and God now marks him. Because he surrendered, God now marks him with a limp for the rest of his life. And that limp would be a constant reminder that you, you wrestled with God and, and your will was broken and your resistance was, was put back and you no longer fought against God. You yielded, surrendered, submitted to God as a constant reminder. So number one, I says the lesson we learned from this very imperfect man, winning the blessing only comes by losing to God. Look what the Bible says as he finally surrendered. Look in verse 31, 32, the verse we read. And as he passed over Peniel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. He's limping. He's, he, I mean, his, his, his thighs, I don't know if you ever had a, a bone out of joint, whether it's a finger or a shoulder joint, or obviously a hip joint is a very, knee gets out of uh, socket. And I mean, oh, and so now he's limping. I mean, a very obvious, pronounced limp. No strength, no energy, lost whatever strength and courage and determination and will he had. It was gone. God had broke him. The Bible says he halted his side. Therefore the children of Israel eat not, even to this day, 
the Jewish people, they don't eat of the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh, until this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that it shrank. So the Jewish people, they will not eat that, that sinew inside of the bone marrow there, uh, inside of the hip bone, because it's a continual reminder that's where God touched. And they still recognize that touch of God. That's so number one, winning the blessing only comes by losing God. Let me ask you this, number two. Your struggle today will be a testimony tomorrow. Your struggle today will be a testimony tomorrow. Jacob's limp isn't so much a mark of discipline, but, an, but a, a, a remembrance of an encounter with God. It wasn't that God was punishing him, but God was marking him that he had an encounter with God. A mark which reminded him after uh, his, the seriousness of which he served to God. A mark of faith uh, which he carried to his grave. Listen, God can make what causes you to limp to be a testimony for God's overwhelming goodness in your life. Even when you don't see things going good, God can make what things cause you to limp to be a testimony of God's continued presence with you. Even in your extended season of loneliness and barrenness of life, God can make what causes you to limp today to be a testimony of God's divine anointing upon your life even when you feel that God's upset with you and God's abandoned you and God's mad at you but that very thing that caused you to live now becomes a testimony for God's glory I don't know what, you're, what, what that is but God can take what is today to be a testimony of God's amazing greatness even when you may be in a state of hopelessness and despair and God looks at your life you look as a, tri as, as a trial as a burden as a, as a, as a, a spur a, a scorning of of your identification, but God says, look at it as something that marks you as having an encounter with God. You've been encountered by God. You've had an encounter with God. I don't know what your thorn in the flesh is. I don't know uh, what that uh, uh, has caused that limp in your life today, but I want you to do this. Give God the praise. For that limp today, I don't know what your thorn is, but, but I want you to give him the glory. I don't know what your thorn is today. I want you to give God thanks. I don't know what the thorn is today in your life. I want God to have the glory and the honor and the praise for all that he does. Why? Because God encounters you and the testimony of your trial can be a testimony today of what took place yesterday. Listen, your trials can become your testimony. The greatest testimonies that we love hearing, aren't they the most tragic? Stories that are ever told? Aren't they the most heart-provoking stories? And we're saying, wow, what a hardship they had to go through. What a burden they had to bear. What a trial they had to go through. What, what, a, what, what an amazing story. But that, that amazement of that trial and the amazement of that hardship and the amazement of that problem is a testimony of the goodness of God and the glory of God and the praise of God. Your hardships of yesterday, your, your uh, limp of today can be a great testimony for God. Don't allow it to be something that calls you to think God's mad at you or to get bitter at God, but take it as a mark that you've had an encounter with God, and God wants that trial to be a testimony in your life. You see, uh, as we look at Jacob, God wants us to use our victories which come from God breaking you to teach others. You've been broken in some areas of your life. God wants you to take those lessons learned in the brokenness to teach others who are holding on and wrestling, say, I won't let go. I'm going to do it my way. I'm not going to surrender. I'm not going to submit. And you can go ahead and dig your, your feet in and arch your back and pull back and resist God's will in your life. You can pull down against God and think you're not going to let go till you do it my way. I'm not going to let go until I get what I want. And you can fight against God. But God will do whatever it takes to break you. And he just reached out and touched the hollow of his thigh. And immediately, all his strength was gone. You know, you're sort of like uh, you're going to walk in the at nighttime, and all of a sudden, that little pinky toe hits that side of the, the furniture, and all of the, the, the pain in that body goes through your whole body, and all your strength is gone. You're like, oh, and every focus of your attention is on that. You're not there to fight a battle, you're not there to resist, you're not there to, to hold your ground. You've been defeated, you've been broken. And God says, it doesn't take much to break you. 
you think you're pretty defiant, you think you're pretty rebellious, you think, think you're pretty stubborn-headed, you think you're pretty re resistant, you think you're going to hold back on God and rest against God, says, God, this is what I want. And God says, what's your name? It's Jacob. Yeah, now you're finally getting honest with who you really are. You're a deceiver. You're a supplanter. You put on an image and a facade that you're something that you're not. He says, once you lose to God, you win the blessings. Once you uh, recognize your trials today is your testimony of tomorrow. Look what it says here, the lesson he teaches. Uh, we see here it says, uh, when Jacob's family asked him why he was limping, he came back after that night alone limping. He didn't go to bed that night limping, but he comes back limping. He could have concealed it. I said, I, I, it must have been arthritis. Must have, it must be something acting up. Maybe I slept wrong. I don't know how it happened. He could have done that, but he didn't say that. Uh -uh. I had an encounter with God. I wrestled with God, and God tonight has broken me. I know today I'm more vulnerable now than I ever was. I'm more weak now than I ever was, but my faith is stronger than it's ever been because I've had an encounter with God. He's about to face Esau, weaker and more vulnerable today than he was yesterday. He was stronger going into it. He had a plan. All right, you guys divide up over here, over here, and here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to handle it. Esau's going to come over here, and then we'll escape over here. He had it all worked out. Why? He was the manipulator. He had it all figured out. But God met with him that night. And now with that limp, he says, you know what? We're not dividing up. We're not going to divide. Why not? I'm more vulnerable, weak now, but I'm stronger in faith now than I've ever been. Because I know God is going to answer this prayer. I know God is going to deliver. I know God is going to work a miracle. I know God is going to do that. You see, your greatest problem can become your greatest victories if when God breaks you, you cling to God, you get closer to God, you depend more on God. You see, the custom was in those days, in verse 32, Moses explains the Hebrew custom, which continues to this day of the Orthodox Jews. They don't eat the sign of the hip of animal because that is where God touched Jacob. And Jacob learn, listen, it's not self-dependence. It's not self-reliance. It's not my willpower. It's not my determination. It's God is bringing myself to submission. He prevailed when he surrendered. He prevailed when he yielded. He prevailed when he submitted to God. Look in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 20. Well, we'll come back, put a marker here in Genesis. We'll come back to that one in a moment. But go to Hebrews chapter 11. The hall of faith tells us about this man, Jacob, he's listed in the hall of faith. Hebrews eleven twenty one. the Bible says, By faith, Jacob, by faith, Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped. Notice now what it said of, of Jacob, leaning upon the top of his staff. His sons now come for a blessing. And where's Jacob? He's still leaning upon his staff. Why? He still has that limb. It's a lifelong limb that reminds him of that night he wrestled with God. That night he had an encounter with God. To, this, to his very dying day, Jacob was marked by his weakness, his brokenness. But it was a mark of a divine encounter upon his life. Encounters with God will always leave its mark on your life. You'll never be the same. You'll never be the same. It'll always leave a divine mark in your life. Jacob implied until his dying day. It was an outward testimony of an inward encounter with God. His encounter with God distinguished him in an unmistakable way to those that saw him. Like Jacob, people didn't know why you limp. They may not know why you limp. Not, not everybody would have known about this divine encounter at the river Jabbok that Jacob had where he rests with God, but they saw him limp. They may not know what's happened in your life, but they see that limp in your life. They see that testimony of that trial, that hardship, that burden, that obstacle that you had to face. They didn't know why he implied, but why he limp, but they saw him limp. Perhaps they not know why you're different. Why you're marked, but they'll see something that distinguishes from someone else. That's why it says in Acts chapter 4, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived they were unlearned, ignorant men. They marveled. Why? They saw something in their lives that was different than anybody else. They saw something that was unique to them than anybody else. There was something different about them. They encountered God. There was a mark of God. There was a limp in their lives that set them apart from all others. You see, your struggle today will be a testimony 
tomorrow. The memorial of Jacob's brokenness meant that God got all the glory. And that's the way God always wants it. Jacob's showing up to meet his brother. All he knows, they're going to wipe him out. What strength he has, it's now gone. What fight he had is now gone. He's got an old branch he's limping upon, leading his family to confront his brother as far as he knew that was coming to destroy him. But he had a strong faith knowing that God was going to work it out because you don't encounter God and leave with a limp because everything that happens from here forward is not going to be a credit to Jacob manipulating this victory. It's going to be all God. The supplanter, what's your name? It's no longer Jacob. Your name's going to be Israel. God is going to be a part of your life from here on out. You're not going to ever try to manipulate things. And so Jacob was placed in a position where he's totally dependent upon God. Can I share something with you? Go to this verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, if you're still there in, in Acts, just flip over a couple pages there. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the memorial of Jacob's brokenness meant that God got all the glory. And that's always the way it works, and the way it ought to work. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. But we have this, earth, we have this treasure in earthen vessel, that the excellency of the power of God may be of God, excuse me, of God and not of us. We have this treasure in earthly vessels, earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. The idea is an old pitcher that is broken and cracked. It's not good for anything. It won't hold water. It won't be able to accomplish what it was able to accomplish, but what it is able to accomplish, there's a treasure inside of that broken vessel. And that treasure as a child of God is, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And through the cracks of the brokenness of a person's life, guess what shines out? The light of that treasure that's an earthen vessel. So I don't, it matters not how broken and battered and bruised that we may be. God says there's a treasure inside of us that wants to shine forth in our lives. It's not about us. It's about God. That's what Gideon's 300 was all about. The army was whittled down. Why? Because the people wanted to know if the battle's won, we don't want the soldiers to take the credit. We want God to get the credit. You see, that's what salvation's all about, is it not? To get to the point in your life where you realize it's nothing I can do to get saved. You think you're good enough to get there? Jesus didn't come to save good people. Jesus came to save sinners. He didn't say, come to save those that are pretty good. He came to save those that are sinners. Until you see yourself the way you really, what's your name? I'm a pretty good person. What's your name? Well, I was raised in church. What's your name? Well, I've been a good, good individual. I, I treat treat my fellow man good. Go follow the golden rule. What's your name? I'm a sinner deserving of hell. God says, now I can give you the blessing of salvation. Because until you see yourself the way you really are, you'll never see your need for a Savior that loves you the way you are. Boy, that's good. You'll never understand the greatness of God's love for you until you realize how unlovable we are to a God that loves us in spite of who we are. And so the vessel is broken so the light can shine forth. Uh, it couldn't be done anything else other than by God. So the blessing you're searching for is not going to come about by striving for it or deceiving to get it. It only comes by submitting. Submitting. Jacob had an injury that would last for life. He was more vulnerable than ever as he faced Esau now. Forcing Jacob's faith to be more fully dependent upon God than it was a few hours before. I wonder what God has to do to our lives to force us to trust Him more today than we did yesterday. I wonder what God has to do to force us. And all He does is just put the, reach out His hand to the hollow of His thigh and His whole life was changed and transformed. Physically, He would never be what He once was, but spiritually, He became what He never could have been without that limp in his life. You see, it's necessary sometimes for God to cause us to limp to increase our faith. We've got to hurry and we're almost done. Let me just give you the last couple points quickly, I'll, I'll bullet points and we'll be done. I said, what are some lessons we can learn from this man, Jacob? Well, we can learn that winning the blessing only comes by losing to God. When you're fighting against God, you're, you're fighting a losing battle because you're holding back the very blessings that God wants to give you. Lose to God. Surrender to God. 
so that God can allow you to win the blessing. I said number two, uh, as we look at this, I said number two, uh, today's trials can be your testimony tomorrow. Number three, let me give you this. By striving only for the blessing, you'll miss the blessing. By striving only for the blessing, you'll miss the blesser. As we look at Jacob's biography, we find that he's always coveting the blessing. Remember he wanted to buy the birthright from his brother? He coveted it. Remember how he dresses up like his brother to deceive his father? Uh, because he coveted, he desired the blessing. And there's nothing wrong with desiring the blessing of God in your life, but you better desire it for the right reason. You better go about the right way to get God's blessings. Too many times we want the blessing no matter how or whatever it takes to get the blessing. And there's God's way to get the blessing God's way if we want it. And so we see him always deceiving. So he was so much consumed about the blessing, he missed the blesser. You're so consumed about that new job. You're so consumed about this new promotion. You're so consumed about that new house. You're so consumed about this. The blessing, you're going to miss the blesser. You're going to miss the one that gave you that promotion. You're going to miss the one that gave you that uh, house. You're going to miss the one that gave you that baby. You're going to miss the one that blessed you with that spouse. You're going to miss the one that did that for you because you're so passionate and you so much covet and desire the blessing. You're looking at other people's lives. You're jealous because God blessed them there and God answered their prayer and God did that. You're missing the whole thing. You're like Jacob. You're so consumed about the blessing. You're missing the blesser that's tied. So the greatest blessing is God, not what God can give you. Because if you've got God God, you've got them all. you got it all. And everything else comes as a result of that. And so we see Jacob uh, miss uh, God. Uh, we see, and I'll just go quickly here as we go through the story. Uh, Jacob in uh, Genesis 28, uh, when he's fleeing from, uh, he comes to a place called Bethel. Remember the ladder comes down and, uh, uh, and, the, and the angels of God and the prince of God is there. And he knew it not. And he named that place, uh, El Bethel, listen, the house of God. And I knew not that God was here. I was here where God was. And I didn't know God was here. You said, well, not me. If, if God shows up, I'm going to know he's there. How can someone as big as God show up and you not recognize his presence? Jacob missed it. God was there in chapter 28. He wasn't aware of it in 28, but now in chapter 32, he's very much aware that God is there. Don't get so consumed with what you can get from God that you miss God. It's one thing to be blessed. It's another thing to have sustained blessings. Okay, you got that answer to prayer, but do you have sustained answers to prayer? Okay, you got that job promotion, but do you have sustained blessings of God in your life. I don't just want a blessing from God. I want sustained blessings from God. How do you get sustained blessings from God? God's the source of the blessing, not the blessing that I receive. Yeah, I got it. And find out, God, if I, you, God, if you just give me this, I'll never ask for anything else. God, if you just answer prayer, I promise I won't bother you more. God, if you just do this, and you're so consumed with what God can give you, you miss the God that can sustain the blessing in your life for a lifetime. You just want the one blessing but you don't want the sustainment of that blessing. Jacob learned that I don't want to miss the blesser by striving so hard to get what I want in the blessing. Many times our blessing becomes history, not being sustained because we failed to acknowledge the source or the giver of God. It was something that God did, but not something that God's doing. If all you have that you can look back to is what God's done in your life and God's not doing anything, then you're missing the God of the giving the giving of the blessing you're so focused on the blessing yeah God did this and God did that and God did this what about today what's God doing today in your life because if you've got God as a focus God's going to sustain those blessings in our lives and so what when God acknowledges he was from the blessing flow Bible says God will give more blessings and all thy ways acknowledge him he'll direct your past and lastly when he died to self that's when he really found himself when he died to self is when he found himself himself whosoever will save his life will lose it but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels the same shall save it the overcomer in the flesh is now overcome he's always figured out a way to get his way and even those 20 years he was manipulating scheming conniving working all the details according to his plan and purpose and now he comes to a point in his life and says you know what he says 
I need to die to self to find out who I really am. Because I don't like who I am. You got everything you wanted, but you still don't like you. You still don't like, you're still not happy, still not satisfied, still not content as a result. And so God uh, was in his place. He didn't realize it. And he had to die to self, and then he found himself. When you don't care to refer to yourself in conversation, when you don't feel the need to boast of your accomplishments and record every good deed that you, you did for the world to see, when you don't itch after commendation and applause, when you don't mind when others are acknowledged and your name is ignored, when you're more concerned with being faithful to God's call, when you're okay with being unknown, that's dying to self. When you're unruffled with less than desirable accommodations, when you're uncomplaining with meager food, difficult climates, rearranged travel schedules, when you maintain cheerfulness even though others around you are grumpy, when you're loving, kind, attentive even to those who can do you no benefit for your association with them, when you remain calm despite interruptions to your agenda, to your plans, by the will of God, that's dying to yourself. When your good's evil spoken of, when your best intentions are misinterpreted and you refuse to let anger rise in your heart or even defend yourself, but rather take it all in patience, loving silence, knowing that Christ alone is your defender, that's dying to self. When you see another prospering, when you see them succeeding with a project that you contributed to, you can also rejoice with them in spirit, being happy to remain behind the scenes, not questioning God, being grateful that their work is being accomplished so that God is glorified. That's dying to self. You won't know who you really are until you die to yourself. Too many of us are much too opinionated, much too demanding, much too critiquing of everything that's going on in our lives and everybody else's lives. And God says, it's time to die to self. Time to die to self. You can't offend someone that's dead. You can't offend them. They're not going to get mad at you. They're not going to give you a piece of their mind. They're not going to vent on you. When someone's dead, you can say whatever. You can do whatever. You can, it doesn't matter. There's no response. And God says, I want you to die to self. You don't have to say everything you're thinking. You don't have to blurt everything you're feeling. You can just die to self. So today, your trial, today's trial, can be a testimony. It's your choice. Are you wrestling with God today? Is it about you wanting your way instead of God's way? Is God going to have to break us to the point and say, all right, I've lost all strength. I, I have no more fight, God. I've got no more fight against you. God said, that's right where you need to be. Because now my strength is sufficient. Now my strength is going to give you the, the, the courage you need to move on. Isn't that what Paul said? I besought the Lord thrice. He says, my grace is sufficient. You'll find grace in time of need. You'll find what you need. But you've got to recognize this is today what you're going through can be your testimony tomorrow of how great God is, how good God is, how awesome God is. And you can say, let me show you what good God has done in my life. Instead of complaining, crying, well, this just isn't fair. I just don't like it. It's just not right. I just don't think it. And you're going on, on, on. Yeah, you're hanging on to God because you want things to go your way. And you don't want to do it God's way. Don't put God in a position where he just has to just reach out and touch the hollow of your thigh. And you've got a limp for the rest of your life. Your strength is completely gone. But your faith in God is stronger than it's ever been. Father, this morning, help each of us to see the, the lessons of faith that we can learn from this man called Jacob. Much of the, the book of Genesis records his life story. And so many lessons we can identify with because we're, we're supplanters, we're deceivers. We're opinionated, we're defiant, we're resistant, we're rebellious, we're proud. We're Jacob. And we're not going to win the blessing until we lose to you. We're not going to win the blessing unless we lose to you. And we're not going to have a testimony unless we look at the trials that we're facing today to give you glory and honor and praise. Lord, help us not to miss the source of the blessing because we're so consumed with the blessing. Jacob did not know that he was in your presence in chapter 28. But 32, he didn't miss it. He didn't miss it. 
I wonder how many blessings we've forfeited because we've grabbed hold of the blessing singular and we've missed all the sustained blessings, plural, we could have had, but we got so focused on the blessing, we forgot the blesser. Our heads are bowed this morning, God, and our eyes are closed. Lord, our hearts are open to you. Lord, I pray you do a work in our hearts, Lord. With our heads bowed, we ask you a question. You're here this morning. If you died right now, you don't know for sure that heaven's your home. You say, Pastor, if I die, I don't know that. I don't know that Christ is my Savior. Are you wrestling with God? Are you fighting with God? You're holding back on God. I'm not going to let go. Well, you're not going to win. I'm telling you that. You're not going to win. It's going to bring more scars and more lips in your life than you have to have. You say, Pastor, I don't know I'm saved. I don't know I'm on the way to heaven. Would you pray for me that I can know that? I'd like to know Christ as my Savior. Please pray for me. How about a child of God? I want you to be passionate about the blessing of God. I want you to desire the blessing of God in your life. I want you to want that. But don't want it your way. Want it God's way. And don't put God in a position where he has to reach out his hand and bring a limp into our lives. It may not be something that's visibly seen by others, a physical infirmity, but you know what I'm talking about. Just something that comes to your life. It, it, you've encountered God. And God's marked you. God's marked you. You've had an encounter with God. You'll never be the same. Jacob was never the same man. After he says, what's your name? It's Jacob, the deceiver. The fake, the fraud. The deceptive one. That's who I am. And God says, now I can work through you. Now we can begin to change who you are and you become the person that God intends for you to be. You say, Pastor, God spoke to my heart. In this message, there's some areas of Jacob's life that apply to me. Would you lift your hand? My hand's up with you. I join many of you today. Father, you see our hands, but you look at our hearts. And Father, we want to have your will accomplished in our lives, but we don't want to miss the God of your will of God. We don't want to waste the years of our life. 20 years of his life was wasted manipulating his will and justifying it as being God's will. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. You got to lose to God to win. You got to die to self. He must increase. I must decrease. Blessed invitation. Our heads are bowed. Let's all stand.